Go ahead. <laughs> Great, thanks, Sergey. Okay. Um, so I wanted to cover sort of some advancements in text to image generation. Uh, specifically, Dolly 2 was published back in March. And uh, I thought it was uh, pretty interesting, especially with uh, some of their outputs. But um, earlier this week, uh, we were, uh, or I discovered that ImageNet, or Im Imogen, or uh, image N, I'm not sure how they pronounce it, but Google Research came out with an article last month um, that is competitive to them and has different benchmarks uh, that were pretty interesting in terms of uh, comparison between the two. Um, so I thought I'd add it there. Um, brief disclaimer, uh, I do have most of the presentation done, but I might switch over to different papers to uh, go through some of the architecture and different things that I have not put in the presentation, but very light presentation. So if you do have questions, please feel free to stop me, ask questions and uh, of the like. But um, yeah, so for uh, the overview, we're going to go over Dolly 2 um, and go over some uh, Imogen uh, ethical issues and then discussion at the end. Um, However, first we have to talk about CLIP or Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. Um, CLIP is the crux of both papers and essentially what uh, each of uh, Dolly2 and Imogen are trying to take latents from. Uh, this specifically was trying to predict more or less uh, where, uh, in, given an image in having a, um, a uh, caption, whether or not they can actually predict whether or not that caption is for that image. So CLIP pre-trains an image encoder uh, with a text encoder to predict what the images were paired with, uh, which text of the data set. Um, they use this behavior to turn CLIP into a zero shot classifier. Um, and then they turn all of the data's classes into captions as a, for such example, as a photo of a dog, um, much like the, uh, images taken from clip itself. Um, one thing, given this model, it is a costly data set um, because it needs quite a lot of data in vision models traditionally have been trained on manually labeled data sets that are really expensive to construct um, and only provide supervision for a limited number of predetermined visual concepts. Uh, they used image the image net data set um, within this space, but they also use uh, privatized data sets that they've scraped themselves. Um, these data sets go up to uh, 650 million and are really unstructured and uh, are pretty biased towards uh, uh, racial slurs, uh, derogatory or uh, suggestive imagery and um, biased imagery as well in, in uh, different types of uh, harsh language. Um, within this model, it's very narrow. Uh, when they only used ImageNet, uh, it was good at predicting uh, the thousand Im ImageNet categories, but it's not all that it can do uh, right out of the box as they put in quotes. Um, they wish to perform other tasks, and so they tried to find through the model on other data sets um, to get additional categories for this text image pairing, um, and they were able to do so. Um, and uh, all they could do is tell that the clip text encoder, uh, the names of the tasks, visual concepts, and then it would out, uh, output a linear classifier of the clip's visual representation. Um, the accuracy of these classifiers are uh, competitive with fully supervised models is what they uh, claim to do. Um, so essentially uh, it's a zero shot prediction given an image uh, or given a, uh, for a, specific uh, image caption. Um, does that make sense? Are there any questions there? Uh, I, on this figure, I, I might ask what the, uh, like the I, I, I1 through IN and T1 to TN represent and you show the blocks. What is the, what? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the end of that. Uh, so in each of the blocks on uh, the, Five by five grid and the one by five uh, grids um, mm -hmm. have either an I uh, or a T. Um, I just could you like put that to words what those represent? 
Sure. So they should be the uh, representation or the latent representation of the image and the uh, text uh, for each other. And I believe they are the docs, the dot product between the two in certain sort of a, a latent embedding. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. So what Dolly 2 is, is trying to do is uh, use what they claim or what they call unclip. And so this is the full architecture of what Dolly 2 is trying to do, where they're given a, instead of uh, given an image to try to predict what the uh, uh, text class or the text caption is, they want to give a text classification and generate an image from it. So here they give, an, I apologize. Here they give an example of a corgi playing a, a flamethrower trumpet. Um, and so what they would do is they would uh, use this clip objective to uh, generate from their image encoder, but they also use a, a diffusion prior and a, um, uh, an architectural prior that we'll talk about later to decode this to get additional samples um, that generates a, a, an array of different images that uh, might come from this sentence. So uh, this is definitely a high level overview of clip. Um, uh, above the dotted lines, they uh, depict the clip training process through which they learn a joint representation space for text and images. Below the dotted line, uh, they depict a text to image generation process where a clip, a clip text embedding is the first fed to an autoregressive or a diffusion prior to produce an image embedding and then this embedding is used uh, to condition a diffusion encoder, which produces the final image. Uh, please note that this, uh, the clip model is frozen during training of the prior and the decoder. Um, one thing to be noted is that they are very ambiguous and it's hard to find details of all of their encoder and decoder sizes. Um, specifically, OpenAI has not given good details on their sizing of networks. Um, especially in related works and uh, they don't have an appendice in their paper and anything on their website, you can't find uh, necessarily what their architecture fully is. They just give general ideas of what they might be. Um, so I apologize if I don't have that information. Um, they've been pretty tight-lipped about a lot of things with Dolly 2. Um, however, we can talk about Unclip. Um, so here they uh, have both the frozen clip uh, encoder that is trying to get these priors ZT and ZI. Um, what they're ex expectantly trying to uh, generate here is uh, the latency between the two um, and uh, extrapolate information from them. And so the unclipped portion of uh, this area is specifically uh, a modified glide um, technique, which is also uh, a thing OpenAI came out with uh, earlier in the year that uh, takes uh, some embedding um, ZI uh, given your sample to produce the probability of what, what X might be given these millions and millions of samples. Um, specifically how they modified Glide in this context is they embed four extra tokens and the tokens meaning the embeddings of uh, specific uh, layers um, plus the glide text encoder. So they're uh, concatenizing um, more information than was previously done with glide. Um, to enable better guidance, they randomly uh, drop some of these clip embeddings. Um, so they have dropout within it at 10%. And then they also remove some text captioning um, just to uh, give randomness to the potential output. So there's more variation within the output images. Um, they uh, specifically uh, use upsampling. Um, so they initially train on uh, images that are 64 by 64, but then use two different diffusion layer upsampling techniques to get to 124 by, or 1024 by 1024 images. And uh, later I can show you in the paper that Google put out um, the difference between uh, the three different uh, embeddings as well. Um, further, uh, OpenAI ended up cropping a fourth of their output images 
uh, when they fed it back into the network. So what that means is they're only trying to do partial images to try to diversify their data set as well to be able to not just train this classifier to produce the exact same image. When we talk about the priors, there is an autoregressive prior and a diffusion prior. Uh, the autoregressive prior specifically is using PCA on uh, this latent space uh, to use only 319 dimensions rather than the uh, 1,024 dimension or dimensions that it might actually have. Um, it adds text as prefixes, and then there is a, a text transformer put on top of this as well that is a 24 block. Um, I think the more interesting part of this would be the diffusion prior, which uh, the authors would agree with, is that uh, it is only using uh, transformers, but it is encoding a, the text specifically um, of the clip and bindings plus uh, sort of the timestamp of when it did it, uh, and then also uh, added noise into the latent space. So essentially it's trying to take these crops of images as they are um, being upsampled, make noise to it so it potentially might uh, grab other um, types of embeddings from the text in picture uh, state and add it to the output image. Um, they will generate two different samples um, where it would only use the, the best one with the doc product from the latent space. Um, to give a little example of sort of what the diffusion prior is actually trying to do, uh, the top row is uh, both uh, the famous uh, melting clocks uh, dolly image. It, no, it's, is it dolly? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's uh, Dolly's image where uh, they're trying to specifically uh, show that they can capture both trees, the color contrast, and uh, the clocks. Uh, one thing of note that they uh, are, are very proud of is that they are also getting different times uh, on the clocks as well. So it is uh, not only learning the uh, large gross objects and the color schemes that are in the images, but also different um, uh, features within the objects themselves. Uh, that's uh, the, the picture on the right is the OpenAI logo, which they are uh, showing just a variety of different uh, designs that it came out with, where it has the same color scheme in most images, but they are uh, in different positions, um, but they have different schemas, all of which have uh, some sort of eight-pointed or six-pointed um, uh, uh, object within the picture. So, um, great. Uh, one thing that Unclip the decoder does is have a, a interesting interpolation between um, some of the images that they have been put in. So uh, variations between two of the, the images by uh, interpolating their clip image embeddings uh, when decoding uh, with the diffusion model. So uh, from this image, you can see they have Starry Night and two pictures of a corgi. They are using spherical interpolation between the two uh, embeddings, ZI and ZT between the priors. And what they are doing is uh, uh, modifying the uh, circular interpolation from zero to one. And uh, they're showing a couple different random seeds uh, based off of uh, the row value. And so what they're trying to show is that there is some kind of uh, interpolation that you can have between them and uh, the way that they end up choosing even a cluster or a set of images that might work is going to be based off of human evaluation, which we will get to here in a second. But um, these are the two example images that they have shown um, and uh, they na naturally blend between content style uh, in contrast between both of the images as they're generating uh, these uh, interpolated images. Um, another thing that they uh, were very proud to show is that they have text difference. Um, so how do we, uh, how do they essentially show uh, two different text embeddings transforming a single image and a scale between the two there? And so they uh, 
applied these images by interpolating between their clip image embeddings and the normalized difference between the text embeddings between the two descriptions. So for the first one, it's a photo of a cat and then an anime drawing of a Super Saiyan cat that's an artisan. And so uh, from what I can understand is that each of the left and right images are the true images, but they are uh, trying to interpolate between the two um, that have very similar contrasts, um, but within a varied scale. So uh, they also perform a uh, inversion of a, a very specific network called the DDIM or a I want to say differential diffusion interpretation model, um, which is a, another way of uh, trying to find contrast in a scaling between two images uh, that perfectly reconstructs the input image in the first column. And then they fix the denoise uh, network uh, across each row. And so at least they are showing the fidelity here between a uh, Victorian house to a modern house with a similar uh, shade of weather. Um, I thought it was very interesting that they could do old to young. Um, I don't know how realistic they are in terms of actually capturing an adolescent uh, lion, but uh, the, the season with the landscape is very interesting. Um, I do think that they, they don't explicitly say it in the paper, but I found a Reddit post saying that this last example might be a little uh, cherry picked only due to the fact that they are the same forest and uh, landscape within different months of the year. So they were kind of cheating a little bit. Um, they talked about the importance of uh, having their prior uh, within the network itself. Um, so samples using different condition signals for the same decoder are displayed here. In the first row, they uh, pass the text caption to the decoder and pass a zero vector for the clip embeddings. Um, so for here, we see a, a group of baseball players is crowded at the mound. Um, with just the caption, uh, they weren't able to get as good as if they had used the text embedding prior on the latent space. So uh, they basically pass both the text caption and the clip text embedding to the caption. Whereas in the third row, they pass the, the text clip embedding uh, image uh, embedded generated by the auto regressive prior uh, for the given caption, which uh, you can argue is is either better or not. Um, they uh, the reason why I think the left area with the baseball players is not as good as some potentially the hedgehog one, where the hedgehog is definitely more in focus, is because uh, human images uh, perform very poorly on these models at the at the moment. Um, so one note to make here is that the decoder is only trained to do the text image generation task uh, without the clip image representation only 5% of the time. Um, and so all that means is that the uh, image representation um, or the text image generation task is only decoded or trained uh, for 5% of the total images for this uh, evaluation. Um, what they did was they wanted to compare to their previous model of Glide and a bunch of other different GAN models. Um, the, the main ones uh, being their previous version of Dolly, they had Glide, uh, I believe Make a Scene uh, was produced earlier in February, but uh, for the evaluation of the performance of GANs at an image generation, they introduced the uh, Fairchet Inception Distance or the FID. Uh, which uh, captures the similarity of generated images to real ones better than the inception score. Um, the inception score is the estimate of the quality of a collection of synthetic images based on how well the top performing image classification model on the inception version three network classifies to the thousand known objects within ImageNet. Uh, the score combines both the confidence of the conditional class predictions for each of the synthetic images, which is their version of quality, and the uh, integral of the marginal probability of the predicted class or their divided diversity. Um, this has been uh, more standard practice instead of just doing an inception score, um, as the inception score does not necessarily capture 
how the synthetic images compare to the real images. And so the goal is to develop in developing the F FID score uh, to evaluate the synthetic images based on the statistics of a collection of synthetic images compared to the statistics of a collection of real images from a domain target. Um, typically, this is uh, extracted from uh, one of the final layers of the inception net. So um, are there any questions about the evaluation? It took me a, a little while to, to really get my head around what FID is. No problem. So samples, um, when compared against uh, both Unclip and Glide, uh, they use the prompt, a green vase filled with red roses sitting on top of a table. Um, and so for Unclip, they fixed the latent vectors sampled from the prior and only uh, the very beginning scaled the decoder. For both models, they fixed the diffusion noise at the seed, at the same seed for each column. And then uh, samples from Unclip improved in quality, the more realistic lighting and shadows, but not change the context as they increased the, the guiding scale. Uh, for semantic uh, diversity at high decoder scales. Um, what they, re what they uh, did uh, further to see the fidelity of these, ima these uh, generated images where they performed human evaluations, which is the uh, top rows of the uh, right column of uh, images where they were checking for both photorealism, uh, caption similarity and diversity of images. Um, and so they were comparing um, both the uh, autoregressive prior and also the diffusion prior um, for how well they uh, produced these metrics given a, a human evaluation. Um, from my knowledge and uh, digging into the text more, they only asked a thousand people uh, to do this evaluation. So even though the data set is very large and they produce a lot of numbers, um, I believe the evaluation seemed small in context of the uh, other numbers they were using, but a thousand seems kind of appropriate um, in terms of uh, comparing between the two priors, but uh, they did, uh, reported figures are in the 95% confidence interval of the probability that unclipped models uh, specified by the roads beat glide. So they sampled the hyperparameters for all the models and uh, they were swept to use and optimize an automated proxy for the human photolistic uh, evaluations. Um, big things are the comparison when using the FFID. They use the MS COCO data set, which is specifically uh, the standard evaluation for GANs uh, or GAN images nowadays. Um, where they had uh, 256 by 256 photos, um, where they were able to uh, test the models uh, across all of them. Um, Unclip with the diffusion prior did perform the best, um, where they ended up having uh, a zero shot FFID with a filter, uh, without a filter, sorry, um, of a 10.39. And these metrics are very much comparative. They're not necessarily an absolute, or we can't necessarily tell what, what it means one way or the other, other than uh, the statistics that they are guiding the FFID are, um, you want it to be as close to zero as possible. Where this uh, model starts to perform badly um, are when they need to uh, bind, or having a lot of bind prompts together. So in the top left uh, sort of comparison between Unclip and Glide, uh, they have reconstructions from the decoder for difficult binding problems. It's, uh, the prompt was a red cube on top of a blue cube. And so uh, they find that these reconstructions mix up objects and attributes. And so in the first two example, the model really mixes up the color of the two objects. And in the rightmost example, uh, the model does not rely be reconstruct the size of the two. So uh, they go even further by testing um, a corgi with a, with a party hat or a, uh, sorry, they, they said a corgi wearing a green bow tie and a red party hat. And so specifically they were trying to bind these colors to the objects. And since uh, they believe the ordering um, is not captured for the uh, 
combining of the two um, objects to the color. Um, they have sizing issues with the glass of milk and the cookie. And then um, below, they really struggle with uh, text prompts. And so the prompt at the bottom is a sign that says deep learning. And so these are their examples of uh, not being able to uh, perform well with that. Great. So that is essentially what uh, Dolly 2 is. Uh, they are uh, one of the uh, only institutes that are trying to limit the number of people who are able to access the source code and try to use or adapt them, adapt the code, um, or even use it in actuality. Uh, I, I think I signed up uh, back in March and I haven't heard back from OpenAI or anything of that nature. So I'm still on a wait list, but you can sign up for a wait list to see about using the application, um, but they're very selective and picky with that. I think the most recent one that I saw was uh, a YouTuber that uh, ends up talking about some of these uh, problems and they were able to access it um, probably for promotional sake. Great. So going on to ImageGen, uh, this is uh, quite a, it's a similar architecture in the fact that they have uh, two diffusion models training a smaller uh, image from a text uh, embedding, but the they claim, their claim is that having the large um, frozen text uh, encoder is a, a benefit uh, to um, the amount of text or de just or depiction or granularity between uh, different phrases to generate these these images. Um, I'm actually going to switch over to the paper. Um, got it. Oop, I apologize. Great. So um, with, oh, we have someone in the chat on the clocks. Okay. Um, yes. So with this, uh, what they are claiming is that they have a larger a uh, frozen text encoder. So uh, as you can see here, their uh, contrast between, uh, or the contrast and length between the prompts of the text is uh, quite large compared to uh, the actual, or compared to Dolly 2 in that sense. Um, and so the one that uh, I think William posted earlier was a uh, brain riding a rocket ship heading towards the moon. Um, I do like that one a lot, um, but these are just selected samples that they have from that. Uh, the key contributions is uh, the frozen language models on the text are surprisingly very efficient. So essentially they're using uh, a larger unit to train this uh, uh, model and then freeze the weights before trying to find the latents. And they found that even going from 6 million parameters up to 2 billion parameters, uh, the larger the size of the uh, the net, the better. Um, they use dynamic thresholding within the upsampling of the diffusion techniques to lever higher guidance, make more photorealistic details. And I'll show you uh, the differences between those. They highlight uh, differences uh, in their proposed efficient nets. Uh, they, they achieve a COCO score of 7.27, which is different than the 10.39 that Dell 2 is reporting. And then they, what they, I find also interesting is they added a new benchmark called DrawBench, which uh, we will cover as well. So essentially, after not going through some of the math, um, what they do to uh, not cherry pick some of the images, they are really, this paper is really uh, trying to compare and contrast Dolly 2 versus ImageNet. And so, uh, what they did get access to the original source code is I'm sure that they were uh, trying to compare, but um, what they were doing is uh, they were sampling from different prompts from DrawBench. Um, DrawBench specifically, I'm gonna jump over here, is uh, it, it consists of 11 different categories of approximately 200 text prompts. What they wanted to do is uh, take the idea of um, 
paint bench, which is a different uh, metric for um, uh, GAN art specifically, where they uh, test against different color, composition, shapes, uh, whether or not uh, the number of objects that they have in there, some color theory uh, is how well it does for um, text caption. And so um, from that, they are able, these are the different categories and they have 200 prompts that both have misspellings, um, wrong order of words, um, and they are trying to at least set a standard for the field. Um, great. So uh, with that, uh, they are able to uh, show at least the difference between uh, non cherry pick data sets uh, from the two or from Dolly 2 and um, ImageNet. Um, one thing that they did was they uh, tried to retrain, or I, I know uh, they didn't necessarily get to retrain all of these algorithms. These are all just uh, prompted from their original uh, papers, uh, from what they were, uh, what they published uh, on their FFID. Um, the photorealism and alignment scores, uh, these are specifically done by uh, comparing human evaluations on the COCO data set. Um, they get better photorealism than uh, Dolly 2, which was under 50%, but they still have a very uh, high, um, it's still not quite as photorealistic in terms of a human evaluation. Um, great. Uh, one thing to note, uh, which I kind of found interesting, um, is they don't really, they, they claim alignment and fidelity is better, but it's still not necessarily at what 100% might be or compared to a realistic image. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, fidelity in this aspect is, uh, does the text align with the image? And so- yes, uh what is alignment? Is it uh, human evaluated uh, or uh, how is it? Yeah, so al alignment in my understanding is uh, the alignment of the, uh, actually, I'm not sure because I know, I, mm, I apologize. Uh, that's image to text. A semantic element that could be only related by a human. Oh, yeah. Right? Well, they, they talk about it. Is it an automatic? It said, it said in there they got like a bunch of people to look at it. Oh, right. There's human. Yeah, yeah but I guess I'm, I'm confused on what the difference between fidelity and alignment would be then. On another question about the resolution, so not only they were able to increase the text prompts, but it looks like their resolution is much, much higher than at least perception. Than that, yes. Right? One thing that's uh, interesting, and they, they get more into this in the uh, appendix, is sorry for the scroll. Um, that's not the one I'm looking for. Here it is. So uh, they talk about the difference between this is the input, the 64 by 64 image, but uh, they were trying to. Uh, differentiate between unmodified adding different connotations of illustration and oil painting. And so the difference here, as you can see, there's more, there's higher resolution in the unmodified, but they were also able to get sort of what is going on in terms of what an oil painting might generate or what an illustration might generate. So you can sort of see the difference in the hair is uh, a good, is a kind of a good comparison. So they're, they're saying they're doing a couple different things with their diffusion model to be able to add these types of contrasts as they scale up. Um, these are very sparse examples, but I thought this, this was kind of interesting to, to say the least. Um, I, I'm, I'm not uh, someone who's an artist who understands necessarily the, the minute details or nuance between different types of uh, paintings, so I don't know how well this is, but from uh, just an, a photorealistic standpoint, 
they do only get uh, 50% saying that their images are photorealistic. Um, another thing that is kind of interesting is they are um, uh, trying to distinguish between the number of, uh, or the layering of their uh, frozen language models. So all of these T5 small, or the, uh, the text, uh, the text model is, I believe, what they're called, but this is um, a very large network. I, I could look this up. I apologize for not having this on hand, but I think this is upwards of a billion types, a billion parameters, two billion parameters. And um, it doesn't look like it's improving very much between a lot of, uh, or adding of the different um, parameters, even though they claim that they do. Um, like this, this figure here, the figure 4B, uh, is kind of misleading in my opinion because they all seem to be relatively the same FFID versus their clip. Um, so I'm not quite sure. I need to probably dig more into the appendices for there for why that's actually interesting or important. Um, the other big thing that I wanted to point out about this, uh, this model, um, other than the really interesting pictures that they produce, which I think is great. Um, one blog post about this uh, talks about how uh, the transparency within uh, uh, images that are produced by um, Imogen are significantly better than transparent images produced by uh, Dolly 2. Um, here they have sort of the Fresnel effect that is happening within this. Um, I don't know how accurate that is potentially in there, but they do have better translucency within there. Specifically, you can sort of see in the tail, but it sort of clears out a little bit as the light is shining on the object. So that's just something that many people were kind of were impressed by. Um, I really like that image. It's pretty fun. Um, there's the architecture that we had talked about. And was there anything else that I wanted to bring up? Oh, uh, these are comparison or comparison images of uh, prompt, or actual prompts by the two. So uh, you can sort of see the different clusters. Um, both Dolly2 and Imogen uh, talked about having clusters of images or images uh, titling a, a two by two um, with the prompt and asking whether or not they think the real image uh, is better or the uh, generated images are better. And there is a metric somewhere where I believe they, they're getting somewhere on 60% uh, or less um, of what is actually uh, more towards the prompt. But um, you can kind of do your own uh, interpretation of the quantitative or qualitative comparison of them, um, where uh, this paper with Imogen has a lot more details and examples. Um, one thing that they do also claim is that they are terrible at using any kind of human generated uh, images. So they've tried many times to do like President Obama holding a uh, the spear of Triton or something like that, and it, it performs very badly. Um, but we have here, right? A horse riding an astronaut. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's just, didn't see anything like that in statistics, or what? why is it getting it wrong? Sorry, what was, what, did, what was the question? Well, this horse riding an astronaut, I mean, who is riding home? Uh, the images don't that's capture fair. the prompt. Yeah, so that's that's another reason why uh, it's very ambiguous sort of what's going yeah, on because like, they, no. they don't release the data at all. Because um, I imagine being from Facebook, they might be taking subtitles from YouTube videos or OpenAI might have scraped too much of the internet in terms of uh, Facebook photos, Instagram photos, um, something of that nature. And so I'm not necessarily yeah. sure what is happening in terms of uh, the data set itself. Apparently, if you specify a horse on top or like riding on top or on back of an astronaut, it gets better. 
weird. Like horse riding is a phrase. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. So it doesn't understand the riding would be covering come up ducting as a one word aliens. And then I like, would then mm -hmm. why I was also thinking that it's like, who's abducting. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, yeah, even even here, uh, just like you said, since it's like kind of a backwards example where pandas should be making latte art. Uh, That's English, I guess. Uh, yeah, you can put a comma or whatever anywhere there. Yeah. Um, On the making or pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it was Alex who posted. I mean, it was uh, deep to the images earlier this week, but there was there's also another. Uh, text image generation uh, paper that came out last year um, that does both English and Chinese and not being a little ignorant and I apologize. Uh, I don't know if Chinese has the same structural rules where you, uh, you need to have an ordering of words where I know in Greece, you can uh, change the words uh, within a sentence and it can mean the exact same thing. Um, but there might be some em emphasis on uh, one word or the other. And so I don't know if, since it's specifically trained to English, if uh, it's suffering from some kind of context uh, within the natural language. How big is the data set, like in terabytes or like a gigabytes or whatever? I, I mean, it's uh, 650 million um, images to captions. And so if we say that the images are all downsized to 64, um, 64 uh, by 64, uh, I mean, I, I would say probably close to terabytes, at least on an, a magnitude order, maybe multiple terabytes um, or hundreds of gigabytes. But uh, the difference between Imogen and uh, Dolly 2 is that Dolly 2 crops all their images, so they might have multiple props. So that could uh, explode very easy in terms of size and data set. Um, ethical issues. Uh, they're not releasing either of these. Uh, and even uh, Google has explicitly said they're not even going to let other researchers use this yet, only because they have uh, done eva like internal evaluations um they've done internal evaluations and uh even come up with um yeah uh, look where is it? here we go so even though that they've uh done recent audit of their own data set uh they've uncovered wide inappropriate use of uh, bad imagery racial slurs and harmful social stereotypes um and they've assessed that it's not suitable for the public uh as many of these need to uh become better in terms of uh efficacy of use which uh doesn't necessarily be, make me feel great um in terms of their pact in 2015 when they all signed uh data or ai uh efficacy laws because now they are able to generate uh, some of these images with potentially us in photos that are randomly generated in many different aspects, even in positional aspects, or uh, use of uh, very Western stereotypes in a lot of these aspects. So I don't know, it, it just seems odd, but um, maybe a step forward. They, they claim this is necessary because it could generate uh, the ability to uh, leverage art tools or be uh, better for um, multimedia generation or uh, help Google or OpenAI make more money uh, faster. Yeah, I think um, we're probably gonna have ethical issues forever. Yeah, how is the how can it be avoided? I mean, it, 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 it's it's anytime they're scraping the whole internet, they're gonna have bias in there. Yeah, because they even said that they tried to scrape for all of these, uh, all of these malicious uh, types of uh, features within the data set, and they couldn't even uh, get everything because they but had think, no auditors. But yeah. I think, like, you know how we get, uh, how we manufacture precision tools with imprecise tools? Yeah. So I think here we could do something, we could train a dirty model 
and then prompt it with sort of ethical slogans or whatever and generate a new data set training that is a little bit more ethical hopefully because we were prompting it correctly yeah verified. and retrain retrain go through but i mean guarantees probably we will not have like we will have some tolerance like it, uh we can reduce but i think yeah it kind of seems hopeless uh, uh, some <laughs> uh, but at the other end i think we, it's kind of a symptom we can try uh, like with humans right it's very hard to get rid of the bias kind of like the GANs thing like the writer discriminators like yeah that. but i mean how do you encode ethics there it's only like evaluation here um well i'm just kind of like positing that the discriminator behaves like the ethicist is it's not a it's not bulletproof it kind of goes back to like like people always say you know like there's no really great definition for pornography but you know when you see it that's kind of like a discriminator and it changes <laughs> with culture change right and how ethical is the ethicist right we need another control loop on the yeah yeah uh, um, but, it, but if we don't have any control, it, that'll probably end up like this. So. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're sort of consequentially, uh, uh, or coincidentally rather, Monai uh, and NVIDIA uh, released a synthetic MRI data set for model training, thousand images, uh, human MRI, and everything. And so looking at we think of ourselves as the expert in images and text, and we're the best thing that we know, right, uh, for uh, semantic analysis of that kind of data. And yet we're having huge trouble, even like here, uh, evaluating the quality and alignment. And now imagine how many people will be able to evaluate the quality and the realism of MRIs when the models generating them in thousands, like, oh, here, here are thousands of MRIs. It's an actual thing, I'm not thinking of. They released it, but it's very hard to say, like, are they even anatomically correct? I know Satra Ghosh, my collaborator, his uh, team is working on trying to generate GAN like uh, architectures to generate at least anatomically sensible MRIs. Yeah. And they, to me, like, on the first glance, they look quite. MRI-ish, I mean, the, the architecture, the cerebellum is where it's supposed to be and corpus callosum is there and everything, but no, like, it's, it's like they can spot it's not real. So it's even the, like, well, they, they have hours of training. Or I think in some of this stuff also, like, uh, it's, the, because they can cherry pick the images, it, it's, it's really, like, you, what they put in the papers versus what you get if you work with it, you, well, you'll notice a big difference. I noticed that in like image and painting with UNET, I know UNET architectures have improved significantly, but I but I noticed in their failure cases, you might go into that that area with like the corgi and, and the bow tie and the hat. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. There's like some kind of like characteristic UNET failures in my opinion there. Hmm. Can you point them? Yeah. Out? The bow tie thing was in the PowerPoint, I think. Oh, was it? Okay. It was in this paper. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, there was a PowerPoint. Yeah. But it's if you can zoom on it because it was so small. Mm -hmm. And what's yeah. up with the clock? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Kevin had a comment about the clock. Uh, the numbers. Can you zoom in on the clock while you're scrolling through? Yeah, the fine yes. details. The fine details you not uh, used to really mess up and paying a lot. Uh, can you zoom in on the numbers? I just don't see them. One, two, three, seven, no, four, no. Yeah, yeah. There's some errors. That, mm -hmm. Are there? Probably. Like. Uh, so there's like, a like these right? things that are just they're kind of blurred. They're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a two. Yeah. It's kind of like they had like a collapse between like somewhere in the space between uh, like one. I think they were they were more pointing out that there were different hand positions, but also there are multiple more hands in them. Okay. So yeah, there is it might be over in other places. But that would be surprised because you're 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 pointing out the translucency there, 
it's like uh, linear optics, right? Um, all of the uh, computation of all of the rays. If it learned physics from just observing, that would be kind of interesting. Well, but apparently. Oh, yeah. it's Corgi bow tie. If you guys wanted the corgi bow tie, it's right there. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. there we go. What, what's so? Can you know. zoom in just on that? I, don't I, can, I can see if I just was, I don't see the phone right now. Maybe it's not there. I have to match. But could you scroll up a little bit? Yeah. I think it was on this guy, like near his eye. You, you, I'd often see it on like the eyes, like the eyes. There's kind of like a blur between the boundary regions a little bit. And, yeah. It's you're you're too you're too peaky. It is a little bit fatter, <laughs> fatter on one side of the face than the other. But mm -hmm. oh, like symmetry is not. Yeah, know. yeah, it definitely messes up some symmetry in some situations. But um, I wonder when I was doing like working with end painting and unit, I, I kind of wondered uh, if how much partial relationships is captured by a unit. Like if it, like how does it. How does it do any of this really? <laughs> like, I, I definitely couldn't tell you. Well, the eyes are the same color. That's amazing, right? Yeah, that's mm. probably pretty standard. Yeah, well, because even the not the good. young, the young one has different colors than the eyes, and they're kind of diffusing between the two. Hmm. Uh, a lot of the face generation models that you see on the internet, that's one of the clues that they're fake is different eye colors along mm -hmm. with artifacts and hair. So it is actually kind of impressive that they're able to match yeah. eye color. Well, this whole part relationship that's kind of like the bilateral symmetry. It's kind of like, it's like the information from one side of the image doesn't affect the generation on the other side or the images. In my mind, it's like something to do with like receptive field between, I don't know. So one thing that I didn't understand, so in the original clip model, from what I understand, uh, when they do clip, your matrix, your outer product matrix is however many samples you have by however many samples, because uh, it's trying to match it with the exact prompt image. But there's no way to do that with 600 million samples. And I know you said that they were kind of vague about it, but is there any idea as to how they actually accomplished that? I I don't. I would have to go look into the paper. I was I was trying to get pretty thick into these two, so I apologize for not getting to that one. No, I mean they're they probably obfuscate a lot of this on purpose, and and it's also possible that they just threw every single scrap of hardware that they could purchase with billions of dollars. Oh. Yeah, I mean, Elon Musk has thrown a lot of money at OpenAI anyway, and Google, of course, has too much compute power anyway. Yeah, the reason I asked about the data set size question is it kind of reminds me of Sergey. Uh, I don't remember what paper we were talking about, but it was like, I was able to do some fairly impressive, I think it was like GPT-3 or something like this. It was able to almost code in some, but it like, the way it's able to like, Kind of fool you is just the massive size of the internet, uh, of the, the data set that it's scraped from the internet. It's basically it's, terabyte, I think. it's kind of like searching Stack Overflow for like the closest thing when it generates code or something. I mean, which is what a developer would do, but it's like it doesn't necessarily have to bake into its system like any sort of structure of language. It, it just, just has to be like the closest match. <laughs> Chinese room is what they call it. Uh, you're looking for. And there's no guarantee that that's that we are as highly structured as we imagine. Yeah, I'm sure we are Chinese room as well. Yeah. To a large extent. It's pattern matching. <laughs> but uh, you had an intriguing phrase in your abstract. Uh, to Jay in the reading group channel when you post that announced that talk, you said you had some ideas or you wanted to discuss some ideas how all that might be relevant to what we're doing uh, with computational uh, neuroscience and things. Yeah, like I mean, you, you sort of brought it up already, but it was just, can we reasonably uh, generate any kind of images that would be example for a toy that is set or create, um, use essentially um, 
human connectome project and go from a uh, thousand samples to a hundred thousand samples do we even try that is that even feasible and i think uh in terms of the ethics and stuff we've talked about this already um but we would need to have uh enough evaluators for this type of um labeling or or even uh have i i just don't think the, the data sets are there um to even attempt this and they're so small compared to um what uh these two large institutions are doing anyway um many orders of magnitude larger um but i don't know if having the finer grain details might actually be better or worse um, because there's a lot more detail within uh the neuroscience data sets rather than some of these images that are just like it's a corgi or it's the face of a a, a house um where there's a lot more detail in terms of the structure like you were saying your collaborator does so i i'm i'm interested in that as a discussion but i i, I know that we're sort of running out of time ish um but it would it'd be on the same lines that we were talking about about five ten minutes ago uh yeah we're out of time but it's good to you know if, to add to contribute to this the discussion so uh, because I have seen, I have seen uh, images where there are um, like ablation or uh, uh, at least crops of images taken out of uh, different types of neuroscience uh, uh, images where they end up um, being able to use GANs of some sort. And this was four years ago, so it's probably changed since then. But trying to uh, fill in those blank spots, especially when imaging can't necessarily capture everything and there's some kind of error that creates uh, a, a type of um, uh, uh, misalignment or some some kind of um, missing part of the data for fMRI. So I don't know to what extent that that research has been continued or or what is out there for for filling in missing data. But this might be a type of uh, method to to look into. But I, I'm not sure. Yeah, but, uh, one one good thing for us uh, in uh, this research is com multimodal combinations because when you don't have enough data that just to get the statistics, uh, if we enable, I think, some inputs from other experts or at least, you know, like when somebody draws on the board, whiteboard, uh, here's uh, how the brain looks or like shows you cartoons of the brain and then shows you different like a real uh, you know human brain when they um, open up cadavers uh, or MRI even like you can you can transfer some knowledge by operating and teaching a student on cartoons and then kind of getting them up to speed with real statistics of the images instead of trying to train a model fully just on MRI images, which are hard to get. So uh, here they're mm -hmm. combining text and uh, images and generation, but maybe we can learn from this how to combine different various signal and train a model that will do better anatomies, right? Uh, yeah. From various sources, just verbal descriptions as well. Like uh, this part of the brain is always smaller than that part of the brain. Uh, like information like that if we can yeah we, get, we would have to digitize every anatomy book in the last hundred years but that, that could be kind of fun <laughs> well if it can read that book yeah and learn from it then that's fine right but yeah i think that's part of the mission of google books it's like scary like that it's kind of the library of congress but they stopped 2012 or something like i would love to see the engram uh statistic happen to support vector machines right they kind of go down there are they at zero now that mentioning uh, all this trends and stuff that was interesting but anyways thanks a lot that was a, a fantastic talk very interesting and uh images are impressive of course and next week is human brain mapping conference many people will be out and out of sync so we won't meet but uh uh, the week after, let's meet and have a session with a slide from each one who is who, whatever you've seen at HBM, virtual or, or, or in person, or and you who's going from the room. No one, yeah, just so it's not too many people. Exactly.
Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.